and take out your Bibles and turn uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through 14 is what we'll cover today. As we get into chapter 4, it's, it's coming to the end of, of uh, a whole line of reasoning that Paul has been uh, discussing, dealing with the church in Corinth, a very carnal church, a a church that has a lot of problems, a church that is is dealing uh, with what Paul has been talking about in the first couple chapters here, um, envy and, uh, you know, preferring one pastor over another and and just becoming very prideful, really, about the pastors that they're under, the teachers that they're under, and really kind of elevating those pastors and those teachers into being like the 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 wise philosophers of the, the Greek and Roman era. And so Paul has really kind of showed that these guys are really just servants that are there to bring the gospel and to build on the foundation that Paul has laid. And so at the root of the problem here, though, is what Paul is going to get at today. The root of the, the reason that you're going after these great teachers is really a matter of pride. And that's what Paul will uh, say today in a very, very strong way. I've entitled the message, You're Full of It, because that's basically what Paul is going to say to them in his vernacular. You guys are full of pride. You're full of yourselves. You're puffed up with pride within yourselves. You're you're just full of of, of um, self-confidence. And that's why you're going after these teachers. You want to go to the church that has the best pastor in town and, and the greatest teacher and the greatest worship team and the greatest building and all that. And it's a matter of pride. And it's causing problems within the body of Christ there in Corinth. And so uh, that's what Paul will address here today. As we get started in the verses there, uh, verse 6, if you follow along with me. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you didn't, did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish that you did reign, that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak and you are strong, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Father, we thank you again for your word, Lord, and we ask that as we now uh, begin to study it together, Lord, that your spirit would come upon us and, and just give us the ability to understand, but not only understand, but to, to humble ourselves, Father, and place ourselves at your feet, acknowledging that you are the one to whom all glory belongs. Father, teach us, equip us, help us to walk these things out in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Paul says it's all about pride, and you guys are full of it. You guys are full of pride, and that is really the, the, at the core of the problem that's going on here within your fellowship. There's a story of a, a very famous missionary, a man of very humble origins. He, his father was a cobbler. He was a cobbler, William Carey. And uh, he goes on to become one of the greatest missionaries ever known. He goes over to India and ends up translating the Bible into three different languages and doing just wonderful work over there. Uh, But towards the end of his life, as he lay on his deathbed, uh, very sick and dying, one of a young missionary friend who who greatly admired Dr. Carey came to his side and, and he was just there 
pouring out his heart to Dr. Carey and saying how much he loved him, how much he admired him, and, and, and just talking about how much of an impact he had made on his life. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But before the young man left, Dr. Carey said to him, he whispered to him and said, come, I need to tell you something. He said, you've been speaking about Dr. Carey. Dr. Carey, Dr. Carey, Dr. Carey. When I am gone, say nothing about Dr. Carey. Speak only of Dr. Carey's Savior. And, and so, you know, I, I think essentially that's what Paul is saying. It's not about me. It's not about the instruments. It's not about Apollos. It's not about Peter. It's not about any of us. Don't talk about me. Don't elevate me. Elevate Jesus Christ. But of course, that's totally against our, our human nature. We want to elevate ourselves. We, we have that issue of pride. Every one of us, myself included, deal with pride. And it's something that we struggle with. Uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote in his biography, if it'll come up here, there's perhaps no one of our natural uh, passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases, it is still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. (laughs) And isn't that true? We can be pride about how humble we are. How ridiculous is that? Uh, Does our flesh get in there and take over or what? I mean, it's, it's crazy how much our flesh wants that adoration from men. And, and so Paul, it really he comes to this place of just saying, this is the problem. This is the reason there are contentions. This is the reason you're preferring one person over the other. It's because of the issue of pride and you guys are puffed up with that pride. Well, the Lord says in Proverbs six sixteen, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And at the very top of that list, what do we find? A proud look. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to, in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and here we go, and one who sows discord among brethren. Top of the list, pride. Bottom of the list, sowing discord. We have both here in the, in the church of Corinth. Proud people sowing discord within the body of Christ. Do you think the Lord's happy about that? No, he certainly is not. He certainly is not. And that is the whole reason that Paul is writing this letter. The Lord is not happy and he's speaking to Paul uh, and speaking to us today. We can't just leave it back there in the first century. We have the same issues because we are human beings. And we have that same proud look and that, that uh, desire to cause problems to make ourselves look good within the body of Christ. And so as we've gone through this whole book to this point, you know, it's, it's really a preventative maintenance for us. How do we keep from having these proud looks and causing the dissension that comes as a result? Well, again, you know, every one of the sins that are besetting this body of believers here in Corinth, at the core of them, they all come back to three sins that, uh, that are prevalent in the human race. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so what has Paul said at the beginning of chapter 3? You're carnal. You're worldly. There's a worldliness that is in the body of believers here. And there's a problem with that. There's a worldliness. It's a carnalness. It needs to be taken out. And so what John goes on to say there, very interesting, these three sins... We all struggle with. They make up all of the sins known to man. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not the Father, is not of the Father, but is of the world. It's worldliness. I remember one time I was riding in a car with my uncle, and I was young, 16, 17 perhaps, and, and I was into rock music pretty heavily at that time. And my uncle knew it, and he was a Christian man and and wanted to kind of disciple me a bit. And he challenged me about my music and and started, you know, uh, pointing things out to me. And, of course, I didn't like that. And, uh, you know, I said, hey, what's what's wrong with it? You know, what's wrong? And I turned the ch- uh, the station, and I said, here's a rock song. And I listened to it for a minute, and I, re- I realized what song it was. Didn't think anything was wrong with it. And I said, what about this song? There's nothing wrong with this song. 
And he said, well, I don't know the song, but I'll guarantee you there's, there's one or if not all three of these issues involved in that music because it's worldly, it's carnal, it's coming from the world. And this is what the world is all about, he told me. It either has an issue with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. And I was like, no way. But sure enough, as I listened, all three of those elements were in that song. Very subtly, but they were all there. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride within our hearts. It is an issue that we can't ignore. It's an issue that is very devastating to a body of believers And it's an issue that we really need to get a hold of in our own lives. And so that's what we'll do here today as we as we go back through this. You're puffed up, Paul says. There's an inflated perspective of yourselves. It's not a true representation of what's going on. You guys have this inflated view of yourselves. You're puffed up with pride. And so what Paul will ultimately say here is that you need to have that perception corrected. And the things that the thing that per Uh, changes that perspective is God's word. The corrective lens that we look at our lives through that brings everything into the proper perspective. It takes that overinflation and it really brings it down to a, 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 a realistic view. All right. Well, as we go back over this together, again, you're puffed up. In verse six there, it says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up upon, uh, puffed up on behalf of one against the other. And so Paul is basically saying here, I have... I've taken Apollos and myself and, and I've just shown us as examples. We are illustrations about how you should uh, refer to all ministers of God, all pastors, all elders, all leaders, anybody in any kind of uh, authority in the church, any kind of leader within the church should be viewed as a servant and not be placed upon the pedestal that you are placing these teachers. These uh, philosophers really is what they were. And so we are illustrations, Paul is saying. Now, What illustration he gives us here in the first uh, couple of verses is very interesting. He says there, learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Written where? Well, written in the Bible, of course, is what he's saying. Don't think beyond what is written. And so there's three points here that I want to make here that are very important this morning. First of all, learn to think in accordance with Scripture. What does Scripture say about the relationships that we have with each other, the relationship uh, in the body of Christ here, our relationship to the Lord. Where do we fit in? If we're going to have this uh, correct view of, of where we are and not an overinflated view, being puffed up with pride, we really need to have a standard that we can look at that, that tells us how we should view ourselves. And Scripture is that standard. Scripture is where you go to find that proper perspective. It's the only place that you can go. You can't go to your friends, right? Oh, does, this, does this dress fit me? Or, you know, how does this shirt look on me? Or how's my new hair? Yeah, well, yeah, it looks great. <laughs> Whoa. You know, I mean, there's, just, there's nowhere you can turn to get an accurate view of yourself like what we find in Scripture. And so... Let's go to Scripture a little bit here. One verse I wanted to bring out that I think really encapsulate the whole picture of where man fits in in light of where God is. Isaiah 57.15 Thus says the High and Lofty One who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with Him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. That's how God describes Himself. And that truly is who He is. A high and lofty one. The one who inhabits eternity. The one who is eternal. The one who is all-powerful. Who has created the heavens and the earth. What are we in light of who He is? Well, we're not much. You dwell in the heavens and I dwell here on the earth. Let my words be few. 
in light of who God is. I mean, really. He is high and lofty. He inhabits eternity. And He has our breath within His hands. He has our, li- our very lives in His hand. And He says to us, are you going to boast in yourself? He says to us, are you going to uh, walk around acting like all the, the gifts that I have given you, I haven't really given you, and you've done all this on your own, and you're going to take the credit for yourself, and you're going to prop yourself up and say how great you are? Are you going to do that, or are you going to humble yourself and acknowledge that the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity has created me and has given me every gift has given me every ability that I have. He's given me the face and the body and the health and and the personality. Everything that I am was given to me through Him. And so if I'm wealthy, if I have a good job, if I have any blessings that I can possibly think of, I have to understand that I didn't create them on my own. They were given to me as a gift. And I need to turn that around and say, you get the glory, God. You get the glory. And that is the humble spirit that God says, okay, you can come. I'll revive you. You're just a mortal. You'll die someday. But those contrite ones, those humble ones that are willing to say that and humble themselves in that way, those are the ones that I want to spend eternity with. And I'll revive those ones. In the resurrection, I'll bring those back and they'll live with me for eternity. And they will inhabit eternity with me. That is the perspective of Scripture. And really, all of Scripture kind of has that idea. Is God wanting us to come to that place of humility, coming to that place of having that contrite heart and, and just giving Him the glory for everything, giving Him thanks for everything that He's done within our lives. And that's really the, the verse there in, in verse 7 where He says, Who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And I already kind of talked about that quite a bit there. Everything that we have has been given to us from Him. Why would we boast and pretend, really, that it hasn't been given to us? And, of course, that is what pride is all about. If you have that great job and and it creates a lot of money for you, and you drive that nice car, and you have that big house, you get puffed up with pride, believing that I have achieved these things upon my own uh, hard work and diligence, and boy, I've done it, and and look at me. uh, People should give me praise and adoration and, 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 and just really say, wow, you're such a smart guy. But really, where did I get those brain functions to have me become this wealthy? Where did I get those abilities to sell or to trade or to do computer programming or whatever? Any kind of intelligence that I have, any kind of gifts that I have, they were given to me. Why would I brag as if I developed them on my own? And certainly there's an amount of, you know, going to school and those kind of things. But all those abilities come from the Lord. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to understand that. I love what Warren Wiersbe says. Strength that knows itself to be strength is weakness. But weakness that knows itself to be weakness becomes strength. Why can Warren Wearsby say that? Why would he say that? Well, he's kind of taking from the verse that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, where Jesus told Paul in his weakness, Paul had a, a thorn in the flesh that he prayed for the Lord to take away. And the Lord comes to him and says these words to him. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so as we go around boasting about all of our strengths, they really become our weaknesses. But when we acknowledge that, Lord, in this area of my life, I'm weak and I need your help. I need your strength to perfect me, to make me complete. I can't do it on my own, Lord. And we have that humble spirit. That becomes a strength because now the Lord is working through us. And when we give Him that praise and adoration that He deserves, man, God can do so many things through us. When we get puffed up with pride and start thinking it's all about me, it's all about me, God can't use us. He can't use us. And He won't use us because He won't share His glory with humble people that are puffed up with pride. 
Uh, the last thing, understanding that, we've, we've got to give Him that glory. The third thing here, if you know that God is the one making the difference and you know that God has given you all these gifts and abilities, give Him glory. Give Him glory. He deserves it. And that is ultimately what Paul's getting across here to these folks. Paul, Apollos, Peter, all these guys are just servants that are coming and and helping you and building you up in your faith. And so don't take the glory for yourself. Give it to the Lord. Give God the glory for everything that He's done in your life. It's interesting what uh, we looked at a couple months ago now in the book of Daniel. Uh, Belshazzar, a very wicked king at the time in Babylon. Uh, the, The vessels that were in the temple in Israel... Uh, when that nation was conquered, all the gold and silver vessels that God had instituted for the worship there in the temple uh, were stolen and taken from Israel over to Babylon and put in the storehouses of the king there along with the other uh, things that were stolen from other nations. And so in a, in a great feast, a, a great uh, debauchery kind of situation where this big party is going on, this big uh, feast is going on and they're all drunk, Belshazzar says, hey, bring out those gold and silver vessels and we'll get drunk out of those gold and silver vessels, having no regard for the God who created the heavens and the earth and those vessels that were created for a very holy purpose. They began to drink and get drunk through those vessels. And at that moment, some handwriting came on the wall and it said, meeny, meeny, tekel you farson, which means you've been weighed, you've been measured and you've been found wanting. You've come up very short, Belshazzar, and tonight your kingdom is going to be taken away from you. Well, he didn't know what those words meant, so he called for Daniel, and Daniel came in and said these words to him. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all of your ways, you have not glorified. Man, that's powerful. You're worshiping these other gods that can't see. They're dumb gods made of metal. But the God who created you, the God who holds your breath in his hand, the God who owns all of your ways, you've trashed him. And you're trashing his holy implements. You've not acknowledged him. You've not glorified him. Very dangerous place to be. But, you know, we find ourselves in those positions often in our own lives, maybe not to such a grand degree. But, you know, when our pride is allowed to get puffed up and when we start putting the Lord on the back burner and start trashing the grace that he has poured out upon our lives, do we not realize that that he is the God that created us. He has our breath in his hand. He owns all of our ways. Everything that we have, he has given us, including our very life. It's a shame that we trash his grace in that way and the love that he has for us. Well, as we continue on there, verse 8, I want to read verse 8 from the Amplified Version. It gives you a, a fuller view of what's really being discussed here. It's kind of hard to understand uh, what's being said in the, in the New King James. In the Amplified, it says, You behave as if you are already filled and you think you have enough. You are full and content, feeling no need of anything more. Already you have become rich in spiritual gifts and graces. Without any counsel or instruction from us, in your conceit, you have ascended your thrones and come into your kingdom without including us. And would that it were true and that you did reign so that we might be sharing the kingdom with you. Paul says, you guys, you're carnal little babes in Christ, puffed up with pride. And you think that you're reigning in some kind of kingdom But here we are, uh, mature believers in Christ, and we're not reigning with you. You haven't included us in that. I wish you guys did have this, this kingdom that you think you have, because 
we're over here getting beat and martyred and uh, su- suffering for Christ and, and uh, really being persecuted for our faith. We are, as he goes on to say there, uh, I think that God in verse 9 has displayed us, the apostles last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. That's where we're at. The mature believers, we're over here suffering for Christ. We're over here walking in the path that He walked, the, the path of crucifixion, the path of uh, denying yourself, being humbled. And you guys are over here sitting on your thrones uh, thinking that, that everything's okay. And it's pride that's making you feel that way. And so it is a, a very stern rebuke that Paul is giving them here. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to see it in some translations. I think a, a great illustration of this is John the Baptist and his ministry. You know, Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest prophet that ever lived. And certainly in the time of Christ, John the Baptist had the greatest ministry around anywhere. The Pharisees were jealous of him. People were coming by the hundreds down to take part in his ministry down at the Jordan River. Hundreds of people streamed down to him to be baptized by him. And certainly that would have been an occasion for him to be puffed up with pride and say, wow, look at all this. Look at this great ministry that I've got going on here. Boy, aren't I great? But John the Baptist was absolutely uh, 180 degrees out from that. I want you to hold your place and just kind of turn over to John 3.25 real quick and, and we'll just take a snapshot of this ministry of John the Baptist and his humility when it came to who Christ was. It says there in verse 3.25... John hasn't been thrown into prison yet, obviously. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Hey, you remember that guy you told us, you know, behold the Lamb of God and all that stuff, you know. He's over there and he's baptizing and people are leaving us and going to him. They're, they're taking away from our ministry. They're a little upset about this and they're a little worried about this. That guy, Rabbi, he, he was beyond the Jordan with you. Uh, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. What are we going to do about this? John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Exactly what Paul is saying. I was given the ministry I was given. And now it's being taken away. And what's your point? It was given to me by God. And now God is taking it and going in another direction. And that's okay. There's no cause for being puffed up about that. John was humble. And that's why God was able to use him in such a powerful way. Verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. I'm happy. I'm content. I know I'm not the Christ. I know I'm not the one that is to be given all this, these accolades and glories. It's him. I'm a friend of the bridegroom and therefore I rejoice in seeing his ministry fulfilled. And then he says it there in verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Man, that is the nail on the head right there. As far as being in ministry, walking with each other here in the body of Christ, Christ must increase and I must decrease. I must be lower. He must be higher. He must be elevated, inflated. I must be deflated and and so on. That is the proper perspective because he's the one that deserves all the glory. 
He is the one that deserves every accolade and every bit of glory that we can give him and more. James kind of talks about the same idea in verse uh, 17 of chapter 1. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so it's that same idea. Every gift that we have, every good thing that we have, it comes from Him. He does not change. Well, uh, I've read the verses there, but I think what we really see is a, a contrasting view Again, of of the way they perceive themselves, the way they act, the way they go about doing things there in Corinth. And Paul says, wait a minute. Do you see the contrast in in how you guys perceive yourselves and how uh, the the folks that brought you into this faith, myself and Apollos, I laid this foundation. Here's the way I'm living. You know, I'm I'm the mature believer. I'm your father in, in a spiritual sense. I'm telling you these things because I'm warning you as my beloved children. Do you see the contrast in in the way we're acting here? Do you see the contrast in the church today? I'll tell you, reading these verses, the way Paul says, hey, here's how a Christian should be acting, a servant, a slave. Look at all the things I'm going through. You've got to struggle with that a little bit because certainly we don't live our lives in such a way. I don't. And so where's the, where's the rub here? Am I living my life in, in a way? Am I imitating how Paul was living his life, going out and sacrificing himself and going out and spreading the gospel everywhere, going out and being persecuted and reviled and, and, and doing even a quarter of the things that Paul did? We have to ask ourselves, why is there such a contrast between my life, between the lives of the Corinthians and the lives of Paul and and some of the other folks that lived and and allowed God to use them in their lives in the in the scriptures don't think beyond what scripture says come in line with what the scriptures say in line with what the illustrations that we find within scripture i think the church in 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 a great degree in the United States and in other places has fallen into this idea that God just wants us to be prosperous and and health and wealth and and all these great things should befall us. And and I don't think God is against prosperity necessarily, but who are we giving the glory to? That's, That's the real rub. We live in our lives in a way that, you know, we're giving glory to God in everything that we do. But when that pride creeps in, we start living our lives to bring glory to ourselves. And that's where the real problems begin. Within the church, there, there's too much carnality. Living like the world. Paul's illustration here is one that is, is very understandable and very relevant to the people here in, in Corinth and in this part of the world and in this age that they're living in. Paul says, I am a condemned man. Uh, We're last, we're displayed last as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle. He is talking about the triumphal entry of the the conquering armies of Rome, returning from a great battle. As they have conquered some nation somewhere or some city, they would return and they would march through the streets of Rome in a long, triumphant procession. And out in the front of that procession, of course, you would have the great generals and the great uh, heroes that were involved in that victory and all the spoils and all the great things. They would, they would be going through there as people clapped, oh, giving glory to them. But towards the end of that procession, down at the bottom here, who do you see? The spectacle. The men condemned to death. At the end of that triumphant procession, Paul says, that's where I'm at. That's where we apostles are. That's where we Christians are. We're not at the head of the line in the world, out there getting all the applause and all the glory and going for those things. We're not the heroes. We are the servants. We are the the slaves. We are the uh, prisoners of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, that's, the place I'm at. 
you guys are reigning on high over here. You guys have this imagined kingdom and all your wealth and all your glory that you're living in. It's carnality. It's pride. Uh, one of the things that just kind of cracked me up here in uh, verse 11, it says, we are poorly clothed. Uh, another translation kind of brings that out in more of a literal sense there. We habitually wear but one undergarment and shiver in the cold. Kind of gross. Another thing that's said here, the uh, where, where Paul talks about in verse 12, we labor working with our own hands. He puts that in there because the Greeks, they despised uh, labor, manual labor. That's for the slaves. That's for the prisoners. Hey, we, we don't do that stuff. We're philosophers. We're wearing our nice white robes and we're going around waxing eloquent about, uh, you know, whatever. We don't do manual labor. But Paul says, hey, we're out here working for a living. I'm making tents. I'm, you know, doing what I got to do to, to, to be able to live so that we can profess God's word. Again, it brings him into a, a position of shame and people are making fun of Paul and ridiculing him. Look at He's, a, he's not an apostle. He's out making tents. He's a tent maker. He's not an apostle. Paul said, hey, I could take the money as an apostle. I, I have the ability to take your tithes and your offerings to support my own living, but I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to bring shame to the ministry. I didn't want to limit the ministry. It's all for Christ. I didn't want to uh, make you guys feel that I'm just in it for the money or any of that kind of stuff. And so I didn't take your money. I just went out and worked so that the the ministry would not suffer as a result. Pride. A very, very dangerous thing. It puts us in that place of thinking everything's okay. What a beautiful day. Everything's going well. Everything is, is just hunky-dory. But you know, pride is, is very insidious. And it kind of just kind of looms behind us, you know, and uh, <laughs> it is it is a lot like pride, you know, to, to have this view that everything's all right and, and I'm elevated and inflated in my own thinking about who I am and where I am. But it's so dangerous. It's so insidious. Pride, it says, that goes before the fall. It goes before the destruction as we prop ourselves up, there is a destruction that comes. We want both is, is kind of uh, something I was thinking about and uh, looking at, you know, the Corinthians and, and how they want to live their lives. They want to live in this, in this place of, of being propped up and, and glorified and not having to work for a living and, and, uh, and just having the accolades of men. We want that. But we also want the power of God. And that's what uh, Alan Redpath says here in his commentary. We want a middle road. A little bit of praise and popularity. A little bit of recognition and thanks. A little bit of applause of men. At the same time, we want the anointing of the Spirit and the authority of God. We want the power without the cost. And that's exactly what's wrong with the church today. We want the power We want God's spirit to fall upon us and we want to have all these gifts and and spiritual abilities, but we don't want to have the sacrifice that it takes to get those things. We don't want to have to pay the cost. And so you find churches that are uh, overly charismatic and overly talking about the gifts of the spirit and and all those kind of things. And and you, you find that often they are the most carnal people as the Corinthians that you'll ever find. And then you go in the opposite direction and and there's just a deadness. We don't want a middle road. There needs to be a balance for sure. But the balance comes in the sacrifice. The road that leads to heaven is the route of faithfulness to God. It is the way of crucifixion with Christ. It is the road of humility. It is the road of denying yourself, picking up that cross, and following Jesus as a disciple of His and no one else. And no one else. In verse uh, 12 there, you know, Paul begins to talk about, you know, all these things are coming against us, but how do we react to them? Again, I've talked about 
you know, you know that you're a servant. You know what kind of servant you are when somebody treats you like a servant. How does Paul react when he's treated this way? He says there, we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. How do we react to that? How do we react to that? Well, Jim Elliott knew this, what Paul's talking about very well. Back in the 1950s, Jim Elliott and four of his missionary friends went down to Ecuador to reach out to the tribes living in the jungles out there. Some of them very vicious tribes killing each other off. And with this little airplane, they found a way to drop messages down to the natives on this uh, big open place in the river where a large sandbank had had formed in the middle of this river in the jungle. You know, you couldn't land a plane anywhere else in the jungle, obviously. So they found this sandbank in the middle of this river and thought, man, we can get down there. And so an amazing feat of aeronautics as they, they landed this plane on a sandbank and tried to make contact with these natives and tried to learn their language so that they could share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, not long after this picture was taken, uh, the tribes became very angry at the missionaries and they killed all of them very brutally, very brutally. And they found their bodies later, washed down the river, hacked and mangled, and it was just awful. And, you know, in 1956, a lot of people, and, and even today, a lot of people said, well, that was dumb. Why would you do that? Why would you go down there and, you know, you kind of got what you deserved? Why would you do that? That's stupid. In the eyes of the world, that's a dumb thing to do, to sacrifice your life in such a way. But after his death, this quote was found written in Jim Elliott's journal. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Hmm? I don't know if you heard that or not. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That was his philosophy on life. God has given me everything that I have. I'm going to give him glory by returning my entire life and whatever that takes in my life. That's the way I'll live it because I can't hang on to my life anyway. I know this life is fleeting. I know that uh, every one of us will die someday. I can't hold on to it. But to gain what I can never lose, that's a pretty fair trade. It's a pretty fair trade. That's how he lived his life. And that's how his life ended on this planet. Well, you ask, how do we walk this out? How do we walk this out? At the end there in verse 14, Paul says, Look, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. I don't want you to be the carnal, immature baby Christians that you are. I want to warn you in such a way that you change how you live your life. And so how do we walk this out in our own lives? Well, I think that there are a couple of keys here that we can look at. First of all, the practice of humility and modeling of humility for us more uh, spiritual believers and, and more mature believers. We need to be modeling it to the younger, to the babes in Christ. But we have to practice it ourselves, obviously, first. You know, from the time that we're born, we're taught, you know, have some pride about yourself. You know, come on, have some self-confidence in yourself. Don't be a doormat. Don't let people walk all over you. Be proud of what you're doing. Be proud of how you look and all this. It's drummed into us and it's part of our nature to begin with. The, the, the uh, fleshly nature that we have is one of pride. And so it takes some time. Uh, As Paul is saying here, you know, when people are reviling you, when people are doing things to you, how do you react? We have to start to practice humility and we have to take those things and we rejoice when we're persecuted. We don't return that reviling. We say kind things in return. It is something that we have to practice and it's not easy. We bless when people revile us. We endure when we are persecuted. And so a practicing of it, a modeling of it, 
needs to happen throughout the church. No matter what level of maturity you are in Christ right now, today, practice to become more humble. Just don't become prideful about your humility. If, if you're a mature believer in Christ here today, who are you discipling? Who are you modeling that with in front of somebody else? So that they can see, ah, that is how a believer should act. That's how a believer should act. Secondly, accountability and encouragement. We need to hold each other accountable. Hey, bro, you're getting puffed up, dude. You are so puffed up with pride. Come on. We need to hold each other accountable. We need to encourage each other when we see a prideful spirit coming through in somebody. Somebody that is in the body of Christ here, in me. If you see me becoming prideful about maybe the size of the church or whatever building we're in, you know, I mean, I was dealing with that this week. Brother told me about a a nice big building on the other side of town that could possibly be a building we could get into someday. And I think, yeah. You don't think I'm prideful? You don't think I'd love to have the biggest building in town and be the best pastor in town? And have the, the greatest worship team in town? Well, we already have that. But, um, you know, you don't think I would want that? My flesh wants that. It's a spiritual thing, right? But I still want that. We get puffed up with pride very easy. It's, it's like that shark swimming behind us. Very stealthily, very insidiously. And we don't know it until it destroys us accountability, encouragement. We must hold each other accountable. We must encourage each other to a life of holiness and a life of humility following Christ. And then thirdly, submission and uh, servanthood. We need to serve each other. We need to submit ourselves to each other as we interact with each other here in the body of Christ. We model humility to the rest of the world who has that face of pride. If we're just as prideful and arrogant as the rest of the world, Are they going to think that we have anything to offer whatsoever? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But in the church, you know, we want to be like the world. Hey, we're cool, you know. Come to church. Be be a Christian. It's cool, you know. You don't have to be all, you know, whatever. We're just as cool as the rest of the world. No, we're not. We're humble servants of Jesus Christ and we have a job to do and we can't let that stuff get in the way of it. We may not be cool but we're saved. All right. Well, in closing, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, you younger people submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. I love that. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The idea of God resisting those who say, "Ah, I'm not going to give God any credit. God says, okay, fine. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. And so what does Peter finally come to the conclusion of? Therefore, be humble, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. God has a plan for each one of us. God has a, a mission for you to go on. Might not be to Ecuador in a plane, uh, you know, you don't know what it is, but God has something that he wants to empower you to do. And when you're humble and you're patient and you wait upon him and you allow him to do that sanctifying work in your life as he prepares you, he can exalt you to a place of servanthood. Exalt you to be a servant, a slave, a prisoner. That's different in the eyes of the world, I know. But that's what we need to be striving for. Humbling ourselves so that God, His mighty hand may come and exalt us in due time. Father, we thank You for Your Word here today. Lord, help us as we acknowledge that our human nature craves the applause of men. Lord, we realize that uh, this is a, a... an integral part of who we are in the flesh. Father, we need your help. We need your empowering ability to give us the strength to overcome the desires of our flesh and the lusts of our flesh, the pride of life, 
the lust of our eyes. Father, we submit ourselves to you. We submit ourselves to our brothers and sisters here in Christ. We humble ourselves before you. Father God,